Um, page 100, John 9, 1 to 7. A man born blind received sight. Let us pray. Open our ears to your word so that we may live a life worthy of your call. Amen. Listen to the word of God as it comes to us from John, the servant of God, through the Holy Spirit. As he walked along, he saw a man born blind. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me. While his day, night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud, and with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, no, but as someone like him, he kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes and said to me, go to Solomon and wash. And I went and washed and received my sight. Praise God, hallelujah, and amen. Let's pray. Father God, uh, I ask that you uh, allow me to be your servant and preach your words, your thoughts. Open the hearts of those who are hearing uh, the Holy Spirit that's in them, that they may see the light of Christ this day. Amen. There's a connection between 8 and 9 in, in John. John 8 and John chapter 9 are connected. And if you've got it home today, read through 8 and 9. You'll find it uh, enlightening. The Holy Spirit is teaching us something different in both of those things. But what's interesting to me, in both of those chapters, he identifies himself as he says, I am the light of the world. Uh, 8.12 and then 9.35. But they're different connotations of I am the light of the world. Uh, if we read it carefully, I want to give you those contrasts. Uh, we behold Christ as light exposing the darkness in 8. In 9, the light brings sight to this man. In 8, the light is dispensed and rejected. In 9, it is received and worshipped. In 8, Jesus stoops down to pick up a rock, or the Jews stoop down to pick up a rock to kill him. In 9, Jesus stoops down to pick up mud to heal somebody. In 8, Jesus hides himself from the Jews because they were going to stone him. In 9, he reveals himself to the blind beggar. In 8, we have a company in which the word has no place. In 9 is one who responds promptly to the word. They're in the temple and they want nothing to do with him. Here's a guy that, wow. Look what Jesus did. In 8, Christ is a temple and called a demon. In 9, he is outside the temple and called Lord. The central truth of 8 is that Christ's light tests the very heart of man and his responsibility, and he is rejected by the people who are in power, the Jews and the Pharisees. In 9, the light is acting in sovereign grace after human responsibility has failed. He goes to one man and restores the sight. I saw the man which was born blind from birth. Accordingly, this man was not transformed by natural cause. The sinner is blind spiritually. We are all sinners and all blind spiritually until Jesus takes the ointment of faith and applies it to our sight that we can see. Except a man be born again, he cannot see. 
We need more than light because the, that shines on everybody. Jesus' light shines on the whole world. Everybody, that light is coming to them all, but they don't all see it. You have to ask yourself, well, why don't they see it? Uh, it's because it's not revealed to them. It is not a matter of fixing our glasses. It's not a matter of reformation. It's not a matter of a, a transplant or a, uh, a device that we get hearing. Uh, it, uh, education and culture, medicine. It's not a matter of ointment, religion. Religion will not save you. Reformation won't save you. Uh, education and culture don't save you. Christ saved you. When you first received faith, that faith came as a free gift from him. You all have it. You've all been, the ointment's been applied to your thinking and your light. That's why you see Jesus. That's why you act the way you do. To love others, to respond to others, to come to church and say, this isn't about me, this is about you, Lord. That's what I love about a lot of people here. They really come to serve Christ and serve others. And why do they do that? Because the ointment is upon their eyes, the spiritual reformation, the culture, and the religion is secondary to that. The natural man is born blind spiritually. We are all born blind spiritually. I want you to get this. Sin entered the world. When sin entered the world, suffering entered the world. And disability entered the world. Did you, did you get something? Buell Land, do, Sydney, we have a song about Buell Land. My church growing up was called Buell Land. That's the time to come. In Buell Land, you are going to be, have perfect bodies, no suffering, no pain. Uh, you know, you're going to walk. That's what the Garden of Eden was before one man's sin entered the world that caused all this suffering. It is the transgression of the womb, Isaiah 48, 8, born in iniquity and conceived in sin, man needs a savior from the time you were born. Just like this man, we do not seek God. God sought you. You may have come to a church ever since you were a little kid and never found Jesus. You may have come to a church and found Jesus. You may have been walking in the world and Jesus went out and he found you. The hound of heaven will get all his children and bring them to him. That's a fact, and that's a good news. That's what's comforting about faith. He did for me what I can't do for myself. And when he did it, then I love him and I want to respond to him. All we did is put our hands out and receive it. We come as blind beggars. And he has come into the marketplace of sin and paid the price for our debt. He went down there to the farmer's market and got the best cantaloupe and the beautiful tomatoes and, and wonderful watermelon. That's you. That was sitting there going to rot if it wasn't purchased. The natural man cannot see light because God has hid it from him. If you understand the work of God and you understand what your life is, it's all about Jesus. It's all about God and what he's done for you. We need a savior from the moment we enter this world. And we entered the world in the womb. God is the God of grace to show us wonder and love. And grace needs a darkness of sin that might shine the more radiantly. Grace would not be grace if it was misunderstood and misappropriated. If you could do something to earn grace, then it wouldn't be God, would it? It'd be you. Now, you think about people who come to church, and when you start preaching the gospel, you start teaching the, the Reformed theology, you start saying this church is not about you and your preferences, it's about him and his preferences. People don't want to hear that, who, who, who think that they're in charge of their life, they're in charge of their salvation. They don't want to hear that when they think that's about them. Their pride. Their arrogance. When we humble ourselves completely, 
pour ourselves out and let Christ be the center of our attention, everything opens up because he opens it and he uses us, hands and feet and arms. I will, Jesus said, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. The moment Adam turned to sin, everything was off the table in terms of you have a right to something. We have a right to nothing. We have no right to heaven. We have no right to goodness. We have no right to mercy. God chooses who he will have mercy on. He chose us. Fantastic. I like being a plump watermelon for him. You know, maybe a seedless one I like. Notice the importance of the disciples respond to Jesus stooping down and picking up the clay. Now, I, I'm, I'm, I'm there. I'm in this picture. Here's Jesus, just left the temple. They want to kill the guy. And, you know, he, he just goes on doing what he has to do. His time hasn't there. He knows he's going to the cross. He knows what's going on. He goes out, and the first thing he does is he goes to a blind man, and he goes and heals the guy. He stoops down and takes up. And the, the first question... His disciples, the fact that he leaves it, I mean, if you were a disciple and your master was just getting, getting ready to be stoned to death, I'd be, I probably would have left the building before he got I don't know. I don't know. I might, be, I might be like Peter at the fire and say, I don't know the guy. I don't know. You know, you know, I understand what you're saying. I don't know if I would stand with him or not. I don't know if I have much courage. But they ask the question. They don't see what he's going to do with the blind man. They ask the question. So what caused his blindness, Jesus? Was it his sin or his parents' sin? Okay, now you ask yourself, you might want to ask yourself this question. Why would they ask that? Okay, I hope you, the theology of this is important. Why are some born blind? Why are people born with disabilities? Pam, why is you, it's a hereditary thing, your ear. Why can't you hear? Why do I have to have hearing aids? Why do we get cancer? Uh, every time you go to the doctor, they ask you that question. How many people, when did your mother die? When did your dad die? They die of cancer. They're looking at family history, alcoholism, family history, right? Uh, so did your parents sin to, to cause you to be who you are to have an alcohol problem? Yes. Did you sin? Yes. Is that the reason for it? Jesus says no. Jesus says that's not the reason for it. So the matter, the, the disciples, what are they bringing out? The result is sin is that the reality is that all disability and all suffering is caused from sin. Flat out just take that to the bank and put it in the piggy bank and put your quarters there and say, why do I have a problem? Sin. Not always my sin, not always my parents' sin, just sin. And we will be in perfection when we get to Beulah land. Adam was in perfection before he sinned. And what was Adam's sin? I don't need you. I can make my own decisions. You see? Now, the Babylonians, the Greeks, and the Parisians, and among others, who followed the doctrine of reincarnation. So, the law of retribution determined that circumstances in which people were brought back from a former life to either poorer circumstances or better circumstances. So, why am I rich? Well, because I did well there, and so now I'm being rewarded. Why am I poor? Well, I didn't do so good there, and now I'm a gnat. That was prevalent among Greeks, Babylonians, and the thing of the day. Now you say, what's that have to do with it? Matthew 16, 30, 13, 14, Jesus asked, do you say, who do you say that I am? They had that same thought in their head. Well, some say that you're a reincarnation of Elijah. <laughs> uh, some say that John the Baptist died, you're the reincarnation of John the Baptist. That theology is prevalent in Jewish thinking as well. It was prevalent in the day. We don't believe in reincarnation. We know better. Jesus is not John the Baptist reincarnated, nor is he Elijah. Those are separate entities. Jesus is the son of God. He's got a gene pool. The theory was rejected among 
many of the Jews and has no spiritual proof. Reincarnation doesn't, is not, we shouldn't think that. And when we read that scripture, we should understand that Jesus is dispelling that. So the, uh, they considered Exodus 25, supplied the key to the whole problem of suffering, was attributed to the signs of the parents, the, the sin of the parents fallen in the next generations. But looking at the whole Old Testament, especially teaching, some could see the folly of such liberal application of the theory of suffering. When you look at the whole thing, look at Job. The Pharisees came up with a third theory, still more unsubstantiated, that a child even in the womb could sin, bringing suffering upon them. That collapse of the building in Florida, that was caused by the sins of the people in the building because they're haughty and proud. Who thinks that? Heavens no. Well, the building collapsed because, you know, uh, God wanted to show us that, uh, you know, these people, uh, I don't know. What, 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 why did it collapse? We, well, we don't know why it collapsed, but we know why it collapsed because of faulty engineering. You know, somewhere along the way, uh, the sands of time have hit the building and it collapsed and people died, 100 people, I don't know, 150, I don't know who died. Uh, look, at the, look at the border situation. Uh, that's from the sins of, uh, you know, the, of our nation that we're rich and they're poor. Uh, we could say the sins of this nation, how we treat those people down there. Uh, people take that theory. Or they're, they're leaving in mass droves because they're being persecuted. Well, that probably is true. I don't know. Is the, is the answer to the question of sin, of the border problem, of catastrophe, of uh, your plight of, you know, whether you have cancer or you had a heart attack or you have a disability of some kind. Is it the sin of the nation, the sin of the, the generations? Well, now, if you're my age, Aileen, and you grew up in Pittsburgh, Kathy, you went, have you ever been to Wilkinsburg? Wilkinsburg was where my home was, if anyone here been to Wilkinsburg and Pittsburgh, it was called the City of Churches. In Wilkinsburg, every corner was a church. I was five years old. With my seven-year-old brother, my mother would let us go down, walk down the hill. It was kind of a big hill. We'd get on a streetcar and go to Wilkinsburg, which was like five miles away from where I lived. And then we'd go there, and we'd go to the movies, and we'd go to... Uh, the store and get trained parts for My parents never thought anything about us going there. It was safe. America has changed people. Is it the sin of the nation that's changed it, the sin of people? Why is there so much violence in the big city? I'm going to add it up and tell, divide it by two. I don't know. And it's a big political question that you can all answer in your own time and space. But that's not what the scripture's telling you. That's not what the scripture's teaching. The heart, and we know this and we believe this, we feel powerless to do something about it. We know that in 1955, Wilkinsburg was safe because it was the city of churches. God was honored and lifted up in, in our cities. We know today that the churches are dying because of preference, because people would rather go play golf. They don't need God. They don't need a savior. And the churches that are living, how many of them, that it, it's about their little club. They don't need you here. They don't need somebody. I, well, I don't need anybody here. Jesus needs you here. And you need Jesus to come here. It's about Jesus. When we start turning our preferences back to him and start looking at him, everything changes. He came to that man, picked him out of the crowd, and healed him. He came to you picked you out of the crowd, and he's brought you here. So when these various theories before them, the disciples ask who sinned, caused the blindness, his or his parents, listen to Jesus' answer and get this. Jesus answered, neither has this man sinned nor his parents, but his blindness is there that God, that the works of God should be made manifest in him. The 
world has changed because we we're not taking care of it like we used to. We're not we're not honoring God like we used to. I don't know how more simple to put it than that, but that's what I believe. Don't take the context of sitting Jesus this out of the setting. Jesus was not saying these people have never sinned. They, of course they've sinned. He was saying that blindness is not caused by sin. Your disability is not caused by your sin. Your dementia is not caused by sin. Your hearing loss is not caused by sin. Your cancer is not caused by sin. Unless, well, no, I take that back. Did you smoke yourself to death? Some cause and effect is sin. My personal sin does cause problems. But in this case, not true. So, uh, there's no question that people, my aunt died of cancer. She smoked like a chimney. She got lung cancer from smoking. She suffered as a result of her sin. My grandmother died of cancer. She never smoked, uh, ate well, did it, natural causes. She died of cancer. But the works of God should be made manifest in Jesus. No, they're manifested in this man. Here is the positive side of the Lord's answer. Get this. And it throws light upon suffering. God has his own wise reason for permitting sickness and disease. And it's because darkness, if you go tonight, turn on all the lights in your house, and it'll be totally dark. Right? Go into the darkest place in your life. And tell me what you can see. Then turn the light on. That's why, <laughs> that's why suffering. When the light gets turned on, you say, oh, gee, I don't want to do that anymore. I don't, want, I don't want to keep drinking like that anymore. I don't want to keep drugging like that anymore. I don't want to keep lying like that anymore. After about 20 beatings, you finally say, okay, I got it, Dad. I'm not going to lie to you anymore. So, God has his own wise reason for preventing sickness and, if, and disease often is that he may be glorified in doing it. Now, uh, Paul's affliction was to glorify God. Raising Lazarus was to glorify God. The death of Peter uh, upside down and on the crucified was to glorify God. There is a present application to this. It is a message of consolation that all work, things work good for those who love God. All things work good for those who love God. Now, once that one scripture gets misinterpreted. In the Old Testament, God, uh, Jeremiah said, What I intend for you is for good and for your prosperity. He was talking to them about you're going to get hammered here. You're going to get sentenced. You're going to get displaced and you're going to go blind and all these horrible things are going to happen to you. But I mean it for your good because you need it. You need the correction. He wasn't saying I'm prospering you, making you healthy, wealthy, and wise because I mean good for you. That's not God's intention in anything. He might let you go on being healthy, wealthy, and wise because you're not his. That has nothing to do with it. You can't assume that health and wealth are equated with that God loves you. One day you will be that. And you may be that. And he may use that for his purpose. He may make you healthy, wealthy, and wise for his purpose. He may make you poor for his purpose. Mother Teresa is a great example of poverty that was used for his purpose. So there is a present application for this, and it's far-reaching. This man was blind for 30 years before Jesus came to him. Trust and obey. Our business is to meekly submit to his sovereign pleasure, 1 Samuel 3.18, and to be duly exercised therein, Hebrews 12.11. For the moment, all dis discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. My aunt died in peace with her cancer. It was very painful. The last week of her life, she had blessings. 
because she gave it to Jesus. We can be certain, those of us who are his children, that whatever is for God's glory in us, it will ultimately bring blessings to us. If you know that, trust that, and live in that, you'll be good to go. This work was, by Jesus' own statement, a work of predestination of God. I must, Jesus says, do the work of him that sent me. Jesus was one in both will and nature to the Father. We have to be that as well. I want to just close with a short paragraph. Make the most of your present opportunities. Know that the key days before us are evil. Ephesians 5.16 And the time is coming when no man can work. This is the day that God has given us. Rejoice in it, whatever the lot. I look around and I see the political battles. I see the border issues. I see a lot of things that I really can't do much about except pray about them. And stand politically where I can stand. Stand uh, theologically where I can stand. Where I stand theologically, I'm for God. He's for me. No matter what goes on around us in this mess, he's for you. He's going to protect you, and he's going to take good care of you, and he's going to heal you if his will. But whatever his will is, is what you want to seek. And it's for your purpose, whether it's painful or pleasant. Praise God, hallelujah, and amen.